Welcome back. In the first video, we talked about how you might consider using groups in the campus platform. Uh, in this second video in the series, we're going to talk about how to actually build a group or, in some cases, how to adopt a group as an administrator of the group. And then remember, there's also going to be a third video that talks about uh, some best practices for facilitation and moderation of groups. But in this case, we want to talk about what it is to uh, own a group, to build out a group, to create the content within a group. To that end, I am in the groups area of campus. Please don't forget, you do have access to the Help Center that has all sorts of library assets and valuable assets that will help you with some of the processes that I'm about to show you. And as described in the uh, earlier video, don't forget about some of the examples and samples that you might start to use to see how other schools have used groups, as well as some ideas about things that you might do with groups along the way. But in this case, let's talk about building out some content inside of a, a group area. If you have access to build a group, meaning you've got the rights uh, and permissions to, to do so, then you will be able to go up into the groups area and click on create a group. Uh, if you don't see create a group, then be sure to ask your uh, system administrator for access to be able to do that. Or it is also possible that you could simply be given a group that someone else has built the shell for, and maybe they've even put some content in and you're now responsible for administering that group and changing or crafting the content. Either way, the process is going to be very similar. If I'm creating a group, I'm going to go in and follow basically the template. I can change the cover picture if I want, and I can change the avatar. The avatar is the tiny little icon that you'll see over here in the left. It will show up for people so that they have a visual representation of that inside of the menu, as well as being at the top of the group page itself. You also will be able to pick from categories that your institution has created uh, and say what kind of group this is. Very often, uh, students can add to some group areas, but not all. Staff, faculty can add to some group areas, but not all. So it just depends what rights and permissions, again, you and your role have been given. At the same time, you'll want to actually uh, put in a group name. That also will appear over on the left-hand side. And then a description. The description is really important because the description is searchable. So the words that you use inside of the, of the description are quite powerful because they can be searched by anybody at any time. Now you can also, in addition to having information here, you can put uh, multiple email addresses, you can put multiple contact pieces of information, you can put links out to sites or links to pages or, or other things like that but uh, you'll want to put in a group description that is, is very descriptive so that people can potentially find it through search, not just by knowing that your group exists in the menu. And then finally, you'll be asked to choose whether this group is a public group, meaning it is findable by anyone that you associate it with, or it is private, meaning it requires uh, an invitation or to be joined uh, as you go. So with that said, let me come back here to a group that already exists and show you that if I have adopted a group, again, if an administration uh, person, an IT person has created a group and then said, you will be in charge of it, the options that I have are still the same thing I just showed you. It's just a little bit different in terms of flow. Instead of the system walking you through one thing after the next, you now have access to go in and change all of those items. So again, here we have the group name. Here we have that, uh, that cover. Here we've got that little avatar and that avatar is currently showing up over here in the left-hand side. At the same time that uh, we do all of that, down here is that description that people can easily find if they are members of this group, especially on mobile devices and things like that. It's really helpful for students to see uh, what's going on in this particular area. And again, I can see whether it's a public group or a private group. Now, there are some other pieces of information that in creating a group you would be uh, sent to on the next page after the stuff that we just looked at and it's right here the contact information you can put in an email so maybe the uh, person who's in charge of this this group or 
uh, someone who is relevant to the department or the office or the organization this, this group represents. You might also have a website that people will want to go see, whether it's the public website or perhaps it's something that uh, sends people off to find out more information about something that is relevant to this group. You can put a phone number, again, for someone that you want to contact. If there are multiple phone numbers, you can add multiple phones. And then you might want to consider actually putting the office location if there is one. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes groups are purely virtual. But if the virtual uh, group is, is more than just that, if there actually is a legitimate location people could potentially visit, go ahead and put that location here. In fact, if your institution has mapped itself with Google, you can literally put the building uh, for some institutions right in here and people could, can find it. I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute in uh, the student view or the user view or the staff view or the faculty view when you can actually see a map. And then finally, you want to really take advantage of labels. So very much like you want to take uh, good advantage of this group description area, really giving people uh, robust things to search and find, you want to consider doing the same thing with labels. Labels are also searchable in the search area. So you can take this metadata and you can have it surround or wrap around the content that you're creating so that again, it's easy to find later. You can actually even click on some of these labels and see all of the things that are pertinent to that label, almost uh, like a, a web, a spider's web, if you will, of all the different things and, and the, the tangents that it, it kind of leads you to. So using and leveraging uh, metadata or labels is really, really an effective practice. With all that said, obviously if I made any changes, I would want to save changes, but in this case, uh, I'm going to come back up here to the top. In addition to having information about the group, you also have access to add members. Now, I said in the first video, and I'll repeat it here, that uh, members of groups are typically auto-provisioned. That means that your student information system talks to the campus system and tells the system which people should be in which groups just like it says which people should have access to which tools, just like it says which people should have access to which pages of content, it does the same thing with pages. Now, what's great about that is, again, you can auto-provision people like seniors. If, if that's an attribute you collect, that you say when somebody reaches a certain number of credit hours or maybe you actually call them a senior, if your student information system has that attribute and sends it to us, then campus will say, okay, put that person in the career services group or put that person in the graduation group or whatever it might be. You can do the same thing with at-risk students and give them access to things like tutoring services or the writing center. So you really can auto-provision users and about 90% of users in uh, all of the campus instances are auto-provisioned. But you do have the ability to add group members ad hoc through this page. Now, why would you do that? Well, typically this is done for, again, students that are creating study groups. Uh, so they're just inviting their friends to be able to study together. Or perhaps you have a group where you wanna bring in an advisor or someone who is not uh, really seeing or finding or being able to search for this group because they're in a different role than just about everybody else that's in this group. You can invite them ad hoc and make them a part of the group. Likewise, you can do the same thing with group administrators. You can bring in other people and make sure that they help you administer this group. So uh, as people start to come in here, you can begin to look for uh, other people that you want to bring in and say, I wanna make sure that this person is also an administrator of the group. Save your changes and you're good to go. But perhaps the most important elements are in adopting a group, they're in the advanced settings. In creating a group, this is actually its own page that talks about the elements that you want around a group or, or in the group for functionality. First of all, do you want groups to be uh, event capable and resource capable? Most groups are. So if I come back out and I look at this group outside of this realm, I notice that I've got an events page and I've got a resources page. Most groups have these. So in resources, you can upload things like files, folders, links out to websites, internal links to maybe pages in the system, different things like that. 
you can see here that we've got uh, application materials, we've got forms, we've got PDFs uh, that people can now download right from here. Now, why is that important? Well, it's contextual. Uh, anyone has, who's a nursing major, if they were in this particular group automatically, then this is probably where they'll come to find information about the nursing major, about the nursing department, and the forms that they need, the application materials that they need, uh, in this case, even the competencies that uh, are associated with this accreditation, they're here. They're contextual. They're, they're bound to this place. Likewise, I could have pages associated with the nursing department, and I could link right from this place to these pages using the uh, add a link option if I wanted. But in addition to resources, you also have events. It really is a best practice to make sure that obviously any event associated with this group be here. That way people can join those groups. In fact, if I look at the details of these things, you can start to see if there's extra information that I need. But it's really a good idea to have all event-based resources, uh, I'm sorry, all department-based events here. At the same time though, you might also want to remind students of other events that you think are important. So, if there is an event that is a, a university-wide event, but you want to make sure that your majors know about it, then maybe you put that here as well. Uh, maybe you simply have a link to other pages where those events live or, or exist. So events are a good thing to, uh, to give people. But in that vein, I, I want to make a recommendation then. In your discussions, you probably also want to include reminders for people to go look at the events page. It's not necessarily something students will check automatically. So having a post that says there's an event that you might want to join, please see it. In fact, you can even link from the events page that is created uh, right in the discussion itself. If that event is coming up soon, you might even consider pinning that as a post. Pinning posts is a really powerful idea in terms of group creation and group content creation. Uh, as you can see, I have a pinned post right here. What that means is I simply wrote out a post. I wrote a post. And after I posted it, I utilized the pin, and in this case, unpin feature. So let me unpin this for a moment. Now I will be able to pin it once again. I just pinned this post so that when a person comes into this discussion area, at the top, no matter what else is going on in the conversation, this is the first piece of conversation that they see they see this pinned post. I'm going to unpin this one and I'm going to take this other one down here, which I think maybe is more valuable and I'm going to pin it instead. Notice it pops up to the top. So uh, you might wanna consider pinning posts that are things like there's an event coming up, pinning posts that tell people about process, pinning posts that remind people about how to fill out forms or where to get resources or things like that. Now, pinned posts are one of those really good and potentially uh, dangerous things, not dangerous, but something that sometimes people forget about. You don't usually wanna leave a pinned post pinned for too long. Otherwise, it loses its uh, ability to really garner people's attention. Now remember, because I'm an administrator in this group, anything I post, whether it's pinned or not, becomes like an announcement because it will show up in the activity feed and it will show up in people's notification area. So it, it really does act as an announcement of sorts, but if I pin it, it also reminds people who come to this group area because it sits at the top of the discussion, hey, this is really important. At the same time as uh, the ability to pin posts, there's also some other really nice functionality that you can in incorporate into your posts from this page. For example, one of the most valuable is pinning as the group itself. When you pin as the group itself, uh, when you post, sorry, post as the group itself, notice what happens. My picture disappears or the, the picture of the person posting and it is replaced with the group's avatar. That tells students that this was official. This was from the department, from the office, from the group itself, not from a person. So that might be something that you want to do to give it a little bit more weight and to uh, encourage people to ask questions directly here rather than finding an individual and seeking them out to try to get answers. At the same time that I might post something as the group, I might consider posting polls, taking a survey of my constituents. Now remember, this will show up not only in this group area, it will also show up in the activity feed of anyone who's in this group. I might want to add an image, add a file. 
And just like I did with the group itself, I might want to consider adding metadata or labels. So I can come in here and I can add nursing as a label to the post. Now by doing that, when people search, they can not only find pages and tools and groups, they can find actual posts that were made because the search term that they use is a piece of metadata. Now it also may be in the post itself and that's searchable too, but it's just something to consider as a, an umbrella or a general rule that you can begin to really uh, leverage labels all across the system to create that web approach to getting people support, connected, etc. And then finally, as a group administrator, not only do I have the ability to post as the group itself, I also have the ability to schedule my posts. Uh, one decent practice is to schedule the posts out for the entirety of a period of time, whether that's a semester or a year or a couple of weeks, whatever it might be. You can schedule a post to appear at a certain time and to, uh, to go away at a certain time. And it's really an effective use of uh, the, the scheduler inside of these posts to keep content fresh, to keep things going as people are looking. That is basically how you create a group or how you adopt and manage a group. There are a lot of uses of uh, these tools and a lot of ways that I hope you can see how to begin to connect with people. But uh, I really wanna make sure that as you walk away from this, that you're thinking to yourself, how can I create a group that encourages connection, encourages behavior that, that is really uh, action oriented and action based to get people the information they need, to get people the support they need, and to get people connecting with other people, whether that's peers or staff or faculty or whatever it might be. So as you think about going through and creating discussions, creating events, uh, creating all of those different elements, uh, don't forget all of it is really, really beneficial and it resonates with people as they start to see the descriptions of what you've posted, as they see the contact information easily on their phones, as they can quickly and easily go through and look at the maps that you've created or the labels that are searchable. All of this really, really connects your users to, uh, to support, to people, to process, to platforms, to other things that they need, to external websites, to resources. It's really, really a benefit. This hopefully gave you a primer on how to create a group or how to adopt a group. In the next video, we'll talk about some best practices when it comes to moderation and facilitation, some thoughts around how often you should post, what kinds of posts that you should consider making, how you should leverage events, and those sorts of things. I wish you all the best, good luck, and good learning.